This is the new Brie? This is the new Brie. Brie 2.0? I would say maybe 3.0. 3.0. Yeah. Yeah. I like this one. Always trying. Yeah. A lot of people just give up. I can't. Like I might if I give up, I just might as well not be here. Honestly. Sure. What if what if people well, no giving up? People the people on a change would be like, oh, what a sellout. She no longer does this, right? You know, for me, it's my career shouldn't dictate who people think of me as well, a person, and sure. that's the problem. Is that when people think of me, they think of Bree's Royal Enfield. There was no like deviation as like Bree as a person or Bree in her personal life. Like my personal life became my work life. My work life became my sure. personal life. And I need, I here, need here. that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I need to enjoy motorcycles yes. again, honestly. Yeah, like yeah. I wasn't even riding for the last couple of years unless it was like, you have to go ride for this. Sure, right. Instead of me waking up in the morning and be like, fuck, I just need to go ride for Brie. Well, so I have that back I wasn't now and I like thinking, it. Nice. Uh, yeah. You're zoomed in and I, and I appreciate that and we'll, we'll get there. But I was thinking zoomed out. Like when you make a change, you change friends. I was just kind of making maybe a little joke. There's a little backlash that... Oh, I've lost a lot of friends. There's since always I've left. backlash. <laughs> oh, really? You, you, oh, yeah. Even here in Milwaukee. I saw. Really? I saw. Yeah, I no longer serve a purpose. That's great. Yeah. That's, there was a quote. Yeah. It's like, quit trying to fit into, you know, the small spaces or something that you used to be. Right? Like, quit trying to change yourself into this box that doesn't exist. Or yeah. we're still in our philosophical. Right away, I appreciate that. Yeah, we're going I'm, deep. I'm Instagram does really that to people. Right away. Right the, <laughs> Scott, right well, the Scott why don't you kick us off here? What is this? What are we doing here? Why don't you give us a... This is the uh, <laughs> Friday podcast. This is episode 26, 5, 20, 25. All right. Well Yay. Done. It's a, it's the It's Christmas week. So it's a heavy week. I don't yeah. know. I think it's not. I think next week's Christmas week. No, it's not. No, it's this Saturday week. is Christmas, so okay, then Sunday is the week? end of the week. It's New like, Year's that's week. That's New Year's. It's like you're just like, it's over. Yeah. That's, it's over Christmas <laughs> week. Yeah. Bunch of snow. And digging, Christmas out, Christmas digging out from the snowstorm. Return all the yes. Christmas presents that you didn't want. I didn't know this was Christmas week. Are presents big in your, see, in your house? Because my family, we all collectively decided that we weren't going to do gifts but then the gifts started arriving at my house and i'm just like guys what that's on them the bro agreement? that's on them i've always been santa in my family growing up for whatever so i just my dad gets his new patio set in florida tomorrow delivered my brother just got a whole bunch of crystalware for me on, i don't get anything from any of them but i love giving <laughs> gifts and i go really hard yeah. and really big All yeah right. but the hardest person shopping for is my son he now always tells me, I, I don't know, Mom. Whatever. <laughs> I, I don't need anything. I think fickle is a fair adjective. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love seeing like people's faces when, like, it's not just the giving, it's like the thought process that goes into it. You know, like, what does that person need or what can bring out an emotion with them? My brother got me a book when I was 17. I'm a big fan of Marquis de Sade. Um, mm-hmm. He wrote French erotica. And my brother found a professor in Ohio that had 120 days of Sodom, the original, um, first English edition. And that was the most thought out gift I've ever seen, wow. but he wrapped it in the most ridiculous boxes. And I was like, what the hell did my brother give me? <laughs> and then I opened it and I cried. And for me, like, that's the kind that's of cool. gift worth receiving did, and Didn't Marky wasn't he a serial killer or something? Didn't no, he, didn't he was a he? sodomist. Yeah, that's what, like, the, <laughs> S&M. That's, he, that's how Sado <laughs> Mac. Mess. Sure, yes, but I thought that he had it. killed people doing that. No? no, no. I mean, he ate his. Own, he cut off and ate his own tongue. Um, really? He yeah, boring. Choked on feces when he died <laughs> in a hasn't. mental institution. Um, <laughs> he was an aristocrat. <laughs> he was. He was, and that he had lived the life of luxury in a mental institution because of his uh, wife. He married into wealth. Uh, but that guy was crazy, and that's why I okay. love him. But yeah, so well, that hold, skipped ever. Oh, wow. Hold, hold on great. to that, because normally we give an update during this time before we talk about uh, choking on someone's feces. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> usually. <laughs> Normally. I mean, that's the normal protocol. But if talking about eating feces is, our, is how we go, then uh, that's, I'm, I'm all about tradition. Started. I mean, I didn't say I did, just the marquee. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Well, uh, I, we start with a little update. It is Christmas week, uh, and um, I'm done talking about tickets. Well, I'm never done. But I was going to say, hey, oh, man. Oh, right. Talking about tickets. But one thing I do, there's a couple things I want to mention, um, and we'll get to you in a little bit, Brie. But we just take a couple minutes to just give us a status of where we're at. Um, do some housekeeping. Some housekeeping. Um, I did give out, uh, all the writers should have received an email from myself. It's a document that I made, a Google Doc. I went deep into Google Docs. There's forms in there. There's all Ooh. kinds of links. And they work for the most part. I, you know. How's the video submittal? portal uh, i give it a, i give it a c minus uh, i give it a c minus the videos that have come in um i think i think unfortunately we need to be a little more specific okay show us your flat out friday was the theme was the theme and um i'm not seeing i'm not seeing that okay well we'll hone, we'll hone the idea yep i can show you some videos after okay. this i'll give you access to the google doc but the point is that there is it so all the writers should fill that out if you would like to be part of our social media part of our broadcast and a part of uh the jumbotron which is the world's largest four four-sided jumbotron or is it the world's largest world's largest four-sided clock i forget <laughs> we have both we have both <laughs> here in milwaukee, in milwaukee. <laughs> um, we would... four-sided downtown yeah Huh. It's the world's largest. The Alan Bradley. Yeah. 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 Um, but we have the world's largest four-sided jumbotron. I think, or we could just we could, if it's not, it's just just, just say it, it, just like own it. Own it. it used yeah, to own be. it. Um, so if you could please submit or fill out the questionnaire, it'll help our announcers get involved. I, I don't know if you guys know this, but years in the years past, when the writers would come in, I had them fill out a written form. So the writers would come in, they'd all fill it out, and then I would take it. And then I'd put it in a folder, and then the race would start. <laughs> and then four months later, I'd be like, "Oh yeah, those forms. <laughs> oh yeah, here they are." Why don't you Why don't you send those forms back to the riders that that have raced with us before and make them read them on camera? Huh? You, that's already that's a massive amount of administration. Yeah. <laughs> it's a massive. You amount can't of send a fucking text message picture of the form to somebody that doesn't seem that difficult. I'll get on that. Yep, I'll get right on. Sure okay. you will. <laughs> 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 uh, <clears throat> but anyway, but there are questionnaires, and so if you fill in that, you submit that, then our announcers have something interesting to talk about about you. Um, and of course, uh, or I don't know if this is of course or not, but our announcers aren't just trained to talk about the leaders. <clears throat> we want to talk about you and all of the people and the interesting stories that you have. Help us tell those stories. I, I also mentioned that we have a broadcast. Um, we have a broadcast, so this event will be broadcasted. Flat out Friday. Friday, Friday, Friday. That's all I ever speak for, by the way. <laughs> There's a few times if 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 it behooves me getting into a conversation, I will say I'm with Mama Tried. If I read the tea leaves to get me into the elevator sale of the situation, but once someone comes to me and asks me about Mama Tried, I nah. <laughs> you got you got to ask Warren that one. He yeah. just got that question. But my point is, I only ever speak for Flat Out Friday. And what I wanted to say is that we have a, a broadcast. Our broadcast will be going out for free. Um, onto the world, into the world. So maybe if you're a dealer of any kind, <laughs> uh, or, or you want to have a party and you can't make the show, uh, consider having a Flat Out Friday party. Bold statement. Um, and then if you would like to come see the show live, which we would prefer, um, come see it live because we are on track to, for a sellout, believe it or not. Uh, Scott or Warren, do you guys have anything you want to say about uh, Mama Tried? Anything you want to tell me? Anything Scott, I should know? We've been working hard on the podcast. We made some progress there. Yep. Um, you know. Oh, because because t- what does that mean? Tell Dan- us. Well, Danger means. Dan's going to come and host the podcast for the, us the, and with the, us, I guess. The in-person podcast studio I, I, that I happens think, on I, Saturday. I still think you need show. to zoom out a little bit more. What is that? What is this you're talking about? On Saturday, well, last year our, our first, the first time we did this, we had a podcast stage. Um, I don't know if we had a name for it, but anyway, we interviewed a bunch of builders. We had local people, uh, people that were visiting in town, um, and we just had great conversations, and we recorded it on video, and we also put it out as audio podcasts. And this year, because I don't want to get trapped doing that all day, and also Dan is better at it, Danger Dan will be hosting that. So Danger Dan is going to be hosting the, the podcast. So he will be interviewing 
our builders, our affiliated guests. Um, is Geared Science part of that? In Danger Dan's way, yeah, Geared Science is part right. of that. Excellent. Uh, and was there anything else? Uh, no, I mean, the same, same shit. We're trying to figure out where to do it. I think, it's, I think we won't merch. be doing it in the bar. We did it in the bar last year, which was great because it was like a secluded studio environment, but it was a little bit off the beaten path, as it were. So I think we're going to try to do it maybe on the mezzanine oh, yeah. with the view looking down at the show. I think mm. it would be a nice Give backdrop. Context, yeah. 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 So. That's great. Uh, making some headway. I want to say that I did buy the Santa yeah. shirt. Sweet. It's coming in the mail. You bought, bought a Santa shirt? I did. All right. Mom tried Santa shirt. All right. uh, and so I, I believe I just bought it. You can still get it if you're in time for the Christmas holiday. Well, it is Christmas week. Doubt but, it. but I don't know if you know this or not, <laughs> Christmas week culminates with Christmas. Yeah. Uh, but in a segue, Scott, with what you were talking about, uh, danger, all those videos you were talking about, can be viewed here in the archive, the Mama Tried Flat Out Friday YouTube channel. You can watch all the ones, videos that Scott was talking about, where Scott was the host, um, for the almost 20 hours worth of Scott. Um, <laughs> and if you could like and subscribe, those things. Uh, that I, is really I, helpful for us. Yeah, comment. I, I Ring feel, the bell. Yeah. These, these, these podcasts, for me, and I'm not speaking for you guys, like I already mentioned, um, to me, must be a dialogue. We're putting out ideas. We're shooting things live. These things are not edited. We just shoot them out live. And uh, we, have some, wait, we have some crazy wait, ideas. Wait, time out. <laughs> this is not an actual time out like we should edit out. We do edit these. We don't edit. I, I've Minimally. Never, let me say this. I've Minimally. never said, hey. We don't edit out content. Do you remember that? We edit out the ums and the ohs and the, the ahs and the. We don't edit those out. And Oops. the burps. There's a lot of those in there. <laughs> there is an audience for people that like herbs, though. Yeah. I've heard. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Hmm. I could bring up your ASMR, yeah. yeah. Mm. Maybe we should have a it's Mama a Tried Flower Friday ASMR like channel. For one episode. <laughs> <laughs> Just talk. Okay. Dude. Oh, yeah. I, okay. I don't know if you know those people that hate that. So just letting you know. Just get your panties wet, Brian. Sometimes the point is sometimes uh, when I've drink we just lost like two years. <laughs> when I drink two forties, for example, and I've never said anything that I have regretted. That's what I mean when it's unedited. Unedited. In conclusion, that's we are now ending the uh, housekeeping segment. <laughs> we are now moving on to our guest. Hey, uh, I, Bree, uh, thanks for coming. Everybody settle down. Are we gonna settle down? It's just edit in like bigger? Oh, yeah, yeah, better. definitely, for yeah. sure. Like the price that, is right. Price one. Is right. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I was gonna say. Uh, Brie, I generally start this question. Um, this is not to be meant dis disrespectful. It's an honest question for the viewers that might not know. What, um, you know, what, what are you doing here? What do you What do you know about motorcycles, Brie? Oh man, I claim to know a lot about motorcycles, but honestly, I'm yeah. not sure. Me too. If I do. <laughs> You're guilty as charged. Yeah, yeah. I claim to have built motorcycles. I don't know if they're still in form or if they've just fallen apart um i've been in the motorcycle industry for 20 years and i've recently dipped out for uh brie 3.0 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right yeah. congratulations all right. thanks it's a yeah. deep hole <laughs> <laughs> it is you were with royal enfield for how almost long? eight years no way yeah really yeah i helped uh reintroduce the brand to the north american market but then introduced the brand to uh latin and uh, south and central america so I, I, I would say that you basically introduced the brand to the broader market of, of both continents. I mean, I, Royal Enfield, obviously everyone knows the mark, but like since you were a part of it, I mean, you really brought Royal Enfield to uh, the forefront. The forefront to like you know to the to the front page of, of motorcycle news. So that Bravo. must have been a lot. Yeah, good job, and that must have been a lot of work <laughs> it, it was i chose to leave uh, professional racing to join this crazy endeavor um i had never worked in the corp corporate atmosphere i spent almost my entire career in motorcycle racing whether, really yeah what were yeah. you doing before oh we'll get to that <laughs> all right um, all right but uh won championships and stuff it's oh, fine we'll okay there. all right uh but i got a phone call i was actually in spain uh with the spanish cev championship and I got a call from a guy that I used to know at Harley when I was the uh, team manager for the factory Buell team with Danny Eslick. So that kind of, he won a couple championships right. for us. Um, 
but a guy that had worked for Harley and represented the Buell brand, and he said, hey, this quirky brand is uh, thinking about coming back to the U.S., and they've been gone for a long time, and we think you're the right person uh, to get the job done. Uh, do you want to do it? And I was like, cool, can I live in Spain? They're like, no. Um, <laughs> I was like, cool, can I stay in Virginia? They're like, no. You have to move to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> I was like, no. Uh, I not really spent much time here outside of racing at Road America and Elkhart Lake. And Wait, you were living in Virginia at the time? I was, yeah, like 15 miles outside of Washington, D.C., and I, I loved it. Well, I was actually living in Spain, but also had our place in Virginia. Okay. And uh, they're like, nope, you have to move to Milwaukee. It's not a remote job. you got to get to know the city. The president decided did, that this is where yeah. the headquarters was going to be. How did that come about? What Rod Copes, the former president, um, had been with Harley for a long time. Gotcha. Um, okay. And he was slated to take over Harley, and it didn't happen. Um, so he left, and he had known Sid Law um, at the time, the CEO and managing director of Roland Field. And they're like, dude, we want you to be the guy that introduces uh, Roland Field back into the U.S. market. And he's like, cool, we're not going to California. We're going to stay here. I live in Milwaukee. I love the city. And Rod, actually, one of the reasons why I loved working for him, and, and he sold me on moving to Milwaukee, he's like, this is the most motorcycle-centric city in the U.S. You cannot find a community that loves motorcycles more than Milwaukee does. Sure. Um, and after being here almost eight years, I have absolutely agree with it. I've never seen so many motorcycles and so many things that cater to a motorcyclist and just the community. On, on my street, I live on the east side. There's at least every other house on my street has a motorcycle. Sure. You don't see that in every city. Um, so he wanted to be here. He thought that this was the center of motorcycling for the U.S. That's really awesome. He got to choose anywhere, and he chose here. Um, and it took me a while to, like, open my eyes and see it. But now that I, I, I can't unsee motorcycles, Yeah, we it's talk everywhere. about it a lot. Like, we get a, we get a lot of eye rolls and, like, <laughs> you know, who wants to come and walk in the winter? I'm like, just, just come with it. Have an open mind. And uh, trust me, they'll deliver. You'll have fun. It's and the culture, and you guys are a great catalyst for that, but, like, it's the culture that's created, and it's the motorcycle community. Like, there's many people I wouldn't know. Some of them are engineers, or some of them are artists, or students, or whatever, and I wouldn't have met them if it wasn't for motorcycling, and I think Milwaukee does an amazing job at bringing in people from, like, all over the spectrum and, like, building that community. Sure, that's yeah. true. Yeah. And, and the people that are involved in the motorcycle world here are, like, also involved in, in lots of other things, yeah. right? Like, they're woodworkers, or they're musicians or whatever and they so there's all these different scenes that overlap yep and sort of yeah it gets woven in right the yeah. motorcycle is part of but that's the common life. factor right yeah, so yeah. like again like you wouldn't know these people if it wasn't for the motorcycle the community that the motorcycling brings in and that's why this city is so good and so rich in that and that why i don't mind living here is it's just and you're, it's ingrained in you like you go outside and you see someone's like motorcycle and you want to help them or you go to fuel cafe you go to anywhere and everyone's very motorcycle friendly mm -hmm. it's not like oh that's a motorcyclist yeah. like where i'm from in virginia if you're riding a motorcycle you must be a rebel you must sure. be an outcast you must be the dude that's like popping a wheelie or doing some stunt on the highway but that's not here it's like Cops wave at you when you ride a motorcycle here, which yeah, <laughs> that's weird. Yeah. I don't get yeah, that anywhere else. So you get a pass from the cops here. For yeah, sure. yeah. Bree, let let me go back um, uh, to tell us what 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 were you doing in Virginia? Is that that's where you grew up? That's where you were born and raised? Uh, oh man, my backstory. <laughs> no, I was born in Florida, Port Charlotte. Kind of got hit by that recent hurricane. Yeah, my uh, parents divorced. Mom, I think remarried or had can, can some. You give me a, can you give me a year? Uh. That I was born? <laughs> no. Or you you from Florida to Virginia? Oh uh, no! So there's a lot in between that. So from <laughs> I was four, so it had been eighty five or eighty six that we left, and then we traveled along the East Coast and then settled in California, um, in Los Angeles. Uh, my mom's family's from there. I uh, spent time in Orange County in Los Angeles, and then my mom settled in Colorado. So I spent my time and my during that time, my dad had moved to Virginia when I was five. But um, I lived with my mom full time up until I was in about sixth grade. And then I was like, dude, my dad's awesome. Like, he lets me ride dirt bikes. My dad, you know, lets me cuss like a sailor. He doesn't want me to. But um, <laughs> I had a, a little longer rope or leash with my dad. So I split my time between Virginia and Colorado up until, I would say, beginning of high school. And then I just decided I preferred Virginia. So I stayed there. Um, went to school there. 
and then traveled the world for jobs. Okay, but uh, Virginia was always my home base. So that's a lot right there. You grew yeah. up with a high school in Virginia. Yeah. You had dirt bikes. You're, you had land. You're, 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 no. You're so nice. my son's father um, was really into dirt bikes, and he caught, probably could have gone pro. So he introduced me to dirt bikes at a really young age. So you were you were young, twenty one. <clears throat> you met when this, I had my son. You met this motorcycle dude. I was motocrosser. Well, I was eleven when I met my son's father. So okay. we've been together pretty much my entire life. I got pregnant at twenty, had my son at twenty one, but I was introduced to motorcycles way before then. Mm. Um, sure. But what's what scene primarily? The motocross. Motocross. Scene? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I didn't know like street bikes existed, um, and then when I knew they were, I thought they were all assholes. Do we have to bleep that out? No. Nope. Um, and I thought it was all guys <laughs> stunting, and then I realized that there was racing. At eighteen or nineteen, I was hired to be. I, I started my motorsports career as a model. Um, I got paid to wear spandex. Hold the umbrella. Um, hold the umbrella. Um, I think I was like 18 or 19, and I got asked to go work at Brainerd International Raceway. It was the last professional race they had there until like two years oh, ago. Nice. Yeah. And I had to lie about my age because I wasn't 21, and I was hired as the uh, full-time Corona girl for the Corona Suzuki team. Um, so that's when I found out, like, Street riding wasn't just assholes. Okay, okay. Or so street bikes. Let, yeah. let me zoom in just a little bit. So you <laughs> they had you, racing assholes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that do it very well. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know how to you know how to ride a motorcycle. You had been around the yard. Or yeah. Ride, you you had ridden on the track. You had. I had ridden on the track. I'd done a couple track days. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I am horrible at everything racing, but I love it all. Sure. Yeah. And I do it all. You've again, seen you me race. Again, you and I have a lot. That's a third yeah. similarity you mentioned today. <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, you got this job as a model from your connection. Your boyfriend had you immersed in this society, if you will, this community. Kind of, so he got me into like loving dirt bikes and wanting to race them. And he used to race against Travis Pastrana at Bud's Creek. Like our, like we were like 45 minutes away from there. We used to go to Bud's Creek all the time. But in the meantime, I was a model for catalog and editorial stuff. Okay, okay. And then a, a promotional agency contacted me and said, hey, we like your look. We know you like motorcycles. Do you want to do a crossover and start modeling and wearing ridiculous spandex and, <laughs> and rubber boots um, on a race grid and sweat your tits off, literally? Um, I was like, dope. Let's do this, and then I just fell in love with uh, street bikes. Okay, at okay. that point. So then you, so then you got promoted in the modeling part aspect, the racing modeling aspect. Yep. And they took you to Spain. No, no. 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 What did I miss so, there? A lot. Okay. <laughs> My journey's quite like crazy. So I was with this team for seven years. Um, but is, not just as a model. Paying you well, it's full time. It's, it, it's a it, it was a, a satellite factory team. Um, they paid me very well, probably more than I made in the last ten years. Um, but I wanted more, so it was just I don't I didn't want to just be a model. I have an education. I have um, things that I wanted to do in life. So they started giving me more because I started begging for more, and so I took over press releases, hospitality, event sponsorships. Um, I used to throw all their events for them. Um, I was paid by a couple of our sponsors to host their parties and events. Um, I like to talk. I also like to drink. And I looked good in spandex at the time. <laughs> so I had like a multitude of roles. And then I was kind of recruited. Um, actually, it was funny. The former team owner called me the other night um, by a guy. And he said, hey, I really like what you're doing. Do you want to run your own race team? And I was like, Ugh. okay, well, let's do it. Like I like a good challenge. Um, so he was the funder, the investor, and I pretty much was like the face of the company and ran like logistical logistics, events, sponsorships and everything. And there was a whole bunch of other stuff that happened in between, but, um, he ended up getting out of racing and said, Hey, do you want to take over ownership, complete ownership of the team? I said, yeah. And we won, um, that year we won the West coast super sport championship with Joey Pascarella. Um, we helped out riders like Cameron Bobier. He came back from racing in Europe and he was on a really crappy team in a situation that was taking all of their finances. And Cameron has a buttload of talent. Like that dude's so talented. And we sat, actually it was at Elkhart Lake Road America. And there was two fold, two folding chairs and it was after the race weekend and ended. And him and his dad came over. Cameron sat in a chair. His dad stood behind us. And his dad's like, I don't really know you, but people say good things about you like could you help my son out I was like fuck yeah let's do it and we helped him get a bike we helped I gave him one of our mechanics I gave him I lent him one of our mechanics who became his crew chief 
Um, Cameron was able to put it on the box multiple times, and the next year he was signed by Factory Yamaha and stayed there until he left for his Moto2 thing. Um, Danny Eslick, I guess I skipped over something. In 2009, I was the uh, team manager for the Geico Buell team with Danny Eslick and Michael Barnes, and Danny won the championship that last year. That year, um, There's a lot of stuff. Sure, okay. A lot of racing stuff. That's a I lot. think that's like a 10-hour episode, yeah. but <laughs> I loved racing. But we had lost um, live TV coverage. Fox Sports was like, no. And then they were changing to like Speed Sport or whatever it was. And then um, a female racer um, had an opportunity to go race in Spain. I sold my team because I'm not a trust fund baby. I don't have millions of dollars and I couldn't do it. I sold my semi. I sold my toolboxes. I sold everything. I told this female Wait, so you were running the team? Yeah. At one point, I so when the guy decided to back out, he sold or gave me everything. So the semi, I had a... Everything. He, yeah. he financed it for you. Like he, he was like, pay me 50 bucks a week. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, but it was my team. And then after two or three years of doing that, I just couldn't do it. Like, sure. I don't, this is all I knew. It was racing. Yeah. I wasn't like a bit, I didn't work for a big corporate company commanding a $200,000 salary at the time. So Wait, I what was, are you talking about? There's so much money in motorcycle <laughs> yeah. racing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I've missed. Let, 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 me, let me go back. Let me go back. You said you you, you have an education because when you describe this job, it seems as though you must have a bit of an engineering uh, understanding or a communication. No history. Degree. History. History. Yeah. History. Yeah, history it of makes what? no sense. History of what? Yeah. So no, I have a basic <laughs> <laughs> degree in history, but with a specialization of women in the Renaissance. Okay. Wild. So you right. you you are into like, uh, yeah, Renaissance history. Is that yeah. your jam? That's. Yeah. Art history. Europe, 1600 Europe. Yeah. But do yeah. you go to the Ren Fair? I do. Dude, I'm such a big Ren. We need to try to get Scott there. He's really scared. You've home. never been? I mean, I've been, and that's why I don't want He's to go really back. He's really scared. First of all, people watching, out of this world, yeah, see, that's you not... get to drink out of big jugs. Okay. You get to shoot arrows and throw axes and then eat giant turkey legs so and then like weekend. talk with a really stupid <laughs> accent. Well... See, I check. Yeah, Dude, you're going. I'm like holding you to it. All right. Um, all right. But yeah, but now I'm back at Marquette. Oh, no. She's got me in a headlock. Good you're luck. going. Noogies the whole and time. And I'm going to make While you call like me your wench. <laughs> Get off me, you wench. <laughs> um, but I'm back at Marquette for strategic communications. I also have a couple like certificates and like minor degrees in like cardiac management and health education and 3D printing. I get really bored and then I just go, I'm going to waste all my money going back to school. So that's a, wait, that's a lot. Hold on yeah. a second. <laughs> I just read about uh, a 3D printed house that they made out of wood pulp and like, did you chicken, hear about old this? Chicken in, wings in um, in Maine. They're doing it. No. Like they were doing 3D printing of houses, but it was mostly cement based ideas. But they're this uh, university in Maine is doing it with like wood pulp and some sort of like epoxy and. I'm not surprised. Like there's so, so many cool. things that you guys don't even know that are made out of 3D printers. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. I got bored for a season. Um, it was off season, and I was like, "I'm gonna go to North Carolina." It was one of the big, first big 3D printing um, companies, and I was there for like three and a half, four months, and came awesome. out with a couple of certificates. Really? Yeah. That's cool. Never used them. <laughs> no, you do use them. Do you? Own, you do use them. Yeah. Do you own a printer? <laughs> nope. Do you go somewhere to have stuff made? Do you I've do never you utilized any of the knowledge that I've gained. You just from, love the knowledge. I just love learning. I think that like once you sh- close your mind, then like you're stupid. Yeah. 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 I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't know. If, if someone told me, Bree, quit your job and like go to just become a full time student and like just take up, take in everything that you can, I would. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I did that. Let me go back to your story, and then, I, and, and then I'll turn this linear, like, you know, who you are, I think all of this is adding up for us to understand. You, you were in Virginia, you got this call, or you were in Spain, you got yep. this call to come to Milwaukee, yep. and, us, and you're still here, even right. though you left Royal Enfield. Yep. Uh, w- w- why? So I have the option to leave, mm-hmm. uh, but I think it goes back to what I was saying to you guys, is like, Milwaukee is a community, it really is, it's like, it, it's a city, but it feels so small, and like, you just you you do feel supported for the most part. Like I feel like if I park my motorcycle on the street, my neighbors would look out for my motorcycle. Um, I feel more connected, even though at the same time disconnected, um, because like you and I were talking before we started, is I lost a lot of friends when I said, "Oh, I'm not with Royal Enfield." They're like, "Oh, you can't give me a bike anymore," 
or you can't like pay us for this or whatever. So, but um, I feel like Milwaukee's a really good community. I'm not done with it yet. Um, I have the chance and the choice to pretty much go over where I want right now, and oddly enough, I'm choosing to stay here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe I'm freezing. crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, granted, I do spend my winters in Florida, so I bounce back and forth between Florida. My dad and I have a house down in Florida, so. Are you, are you here now in Milwaukee because you're living here, or are you taking a vacation from Florida? Does that make sense? Like, why are you not there right now? I'm taking a vacation from Florida. Okay, well, yeah. thanks for coming. So in the in the winter, <laughs> I, I that's I actually don't like Florida in the summer or spring. It's too hot. Uh, so in the winter, I go down there, and then the spring, summer, and fall, I'm up here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can Can you put a Can you put a bow on you leaving Royal Enfield? You know, this has never been a gossip show or anything. You know, I don't want you to say anything bad or throw anybody under the bus. And we, if if anybody, we support and understand the idea of being burned out and making a life change yeah um can you you want to sum that up we did we just to back up for a second did, we, i know we were we were talking about your timeline but was were we talking about that you'd been with it royal infield for eight years it, will, it, it would have been eight years in february yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so uh, you were with them for a long time because I, I believe in the brand yeah. i honestly do i think royal infield was um paying attention to a market that was neglected for a really long time. Yeah. Um, what, 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 what market is that? The middleweight segment um, and also the accessibility. Wait, 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 wait. You're, you're saying that, you know, it rolls off your tongue because you yeah. say it in a closed. <laughs> so explain that to me to someone that doesn't know what you just said. That was a marketing term. It, it was, I'm sorry. And what does it mean? Middle Turn off segment. marketing head. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> motorcycles that are lower in CCs, um, also lower in price uh, for a long time. And I'm not, I love, I own, every brand so let's just say that out there i'm not bashing any you go into any one of my garages and i have every brand you could possibly think of including two of these in the background um you can you know what we can talk about <laughs> everyone <laughs> went the american public became like an in, or the consumer for motorcycles became an inverted pyramid bigger was the largest segment so bigger ccs higher price motorcycles and then the smaller ccs or middleweight to smaller were getting forgotten um, and people are having to take out massive loans or mortgage a house to buy motorcycles. And the reason I joined Royal Enfield is because I believed in making motorcycles accessible for everybody and anybody. Uh, I also don't think that you need something huge to have fun. And one of the things that I took from my time over in India is like pure motorcycling. And that's it. Like you get on your motorcycle, you turn the key and you just go. Um, it, I don't necessarily need the speed I don't need it I just need to feel a connection with something and a motorcycle is a great way to connect uh yeah the, those roles are great in the Himalayas I, I, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm you know I'm quick to judge I, I saw that thing I'm like what the fuck <laughs> Me but too. I, I, I was really impressed by the time I was done like that thing's like oh billy goat and you're a big motherfucker yeah, yeah. it was a good little bike I mean like yeah. it, they're not fast you can't get out of control no. with them which is pretty warm which is up great in the mountains, up there because it's yeah it's no joke you just want to chugger and something yeah. that like you like get second you gear you don't need to clutch no you know just kind of just keep you climbing don't. yeah no. tell, tell me about because they're, they're indian based yep yes even the ones i would buy here in milwaukee are from india yep and uh and you drove them through the himalayas himalayans yeah the himalayas. Himalayas. They, himalayas. Yeah. we did a helmet tour with helmet stories Mm -hmm. Those big yeah. 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 This is the 650s. We were, yeah. the, we no, were, that was on the. You guys bullets. did it on the bullets and the classics, so they probably did it on 350s. That's a they lot didn't of even sell the 500s oh, over right. in India. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was it was glamping basically. Mm -hmm. You know, they took care of us. We rode bikes. They worked on them while we were drinking. People people uh, were impressed or supportive. I guess is a better word when you rode by on a Royal Enfield. Well, well there's in not India, a it's lot like a cult status. Yeah. yeah, but in yeah. Royal Enfield, it's as you know. It's you as ubiquitous as Harley Davidson is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's not really that much. There's not. There's not a lot that isn't that, unless it's like a Pulsar or like another Asian TVS brand. TVS or yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I mean, so this is this is the crazy thing, and I was actually talking about it earlier with Rod Copes because I was with him earlier today. In so if you take uh, Mercedes in Germany, that's what the taxi drivers drive. That's what the lower income people are. But anywhere in any other market, it's a luxury brand. Right? Same with Harley. You take Royal Enfield and its home market. It's a luxury brand in its own home market, but it's not anywhere else. Really? It is the only brand on the planet that it's reversed for everything else. So in India, it's a luxury brand. It's, it's aspirational. It's inspirational. Mm -hmm. That was the problem that we had is making or 
making sure that the global team in India knew the battles that we had to fight here and in Europe, right? Because the price point, the the, C, the size of the CC and what we were trying to position the brand is here. And I think we did it. Like, I think this year they'll end with like 13,000 in sales, which is great. We started at 400 in sales just six years ago when we were able to start selling. Really? So that's just in the US market. But uh, taking a brand that's known as a luxury brand and then trying to somewhat convert or change that proposition or positioning to every other market is a feat in itself, and it's very tiring. <laughs> Maybe why I decided to flee from the Um But it's it again like there is a reason why we're selling motorcycles now is we're introducing the simplicity to motorcycling mm -hmm. and keeping it. I don't basics not a good word, but I I can't think of another word right now but just simplifying it and just you know your son could go buy a royal infield right now and not have to take out you know a loan he could probably buy it on a credit card that mm -hmm. would be given to him at 2021 20, you can be a guy that rides a harley but your road glide is so big riding around the city and it's just not fun parking mm -hmm. so we have a lot of people that own harleys as they're like a bit they're touring bikes like long highways long hauls but then they ride a Royal Enfield in the city because it's easier to like maneuver around. It is a motorcycle for everyone. I love Royal Enfield. I appreciate the opportunity that they gave me to introduce or reintroduce a brand to multiple continents. And I don't think I would be at the position I'm at with this new company today if Royal Enfield hadn't believed in me. So I have yeah, nothing the, but fantastic things to say about mm -hmm. Royal Enfield. Yeah, like do it in the shadow of the mothership too, right? Like. You know, yeah. that's a <laughs> that's huge that yeah. is huge that's oh massive. trust me yeah. Yeah. yeah so the the rumor going around it was not even at royal infield at harley was that i resigned from royal infield to sell insurance <laughs> i was getting blown up they even knew before like i had told anybody i have no idea how the people at harley knew but they're like Yo, I heard Bree's leaving to go sell uh, health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, like fuck that. that like, like that's your skill set. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Like, I'd be like, 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 like she's like, yeah, she's going to go wash dishes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, yeah. But they were so. Like, no offense against yeah insurance salespeople yeah, or, dish, or dish dishwashers. Or dishwashers. <laughs> I wash dishes every night. I started my life. How do you get these fingers clean? Yeah. But it was dishes. like really. Funny, and we did it, and we got a lot of flack for like, dude, you're invading like Harley's territory. No, like Milwaukee is a very motorcycle centric city, and more and more, and every single day, you're finding you know sport bikes or Triumphs or Royal Enfields or whatever. And like, that's the problem with motorcycle brands as themselves is they try to be exclusive instead of inclusive. Yeah. And that's the one thing that I try to do at Royal Enfield is like, dude, I don't give a shit what you ride as long as you ride. Like, you want to come to a Royal Enfield barbecue and roll up on a Triumph? We'll see you there. Yeah. Um, also, like, with brands, like, saying, like, oh, I don't want another brand there because we sponsor you. Hell no. Like, that's just, that's not the way Royal Enfield was. Yeah. And the motorcycling industry be. has been taking hit after hit after hit for over a decade. And if we don't start working together, or not us, them, then it's just not going to grow. It's yeah. not going to continue. So, yeah, that was the battle I was always fighting is, like, stop trying to be exclusive Motorcycling is rad. 100%. It doesn't matter what you're riding. Yeah, I agree. We could go. We could. Like, I love my Honda Goldwing. Yeah. Give me a new yeah. one. I, I yeah. think you guys got this. I'm going to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could wax philosophic on that subject for, for hours, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, but I, I think ultimately, you, were you going to say something? No. Oh, sorry. Because I, I do think you wrapped up your time at Enfield up in a nice ball. So thanks well, for yeah, that. The, well, the, no. the BTR thing. Like, yeah, that's what? the thing I wanted to talk yeah. about because there's the component. It's not only wedging yourself into the market, the North American market with Enfield, and then doing it in the town of Harley Davidson, which is pretty admirable, but also like bringing women into racing and riding in, in a very visible way, I think. Yeah, which and was, like, it is, comes full circle now knowing your background. Like I had no idea, right? Like yeah, now it makes sense. like, why is this chick trying to do racing? What it makes sense. No, so I kind of, it actually goes beyond that. So when, we came in when Royal Enfield came here and we started doing anything. The one program I paid attention to was Build Moto. And I'm like, how can I grow this to be a national program? And why the hell aren't other OEMs that already existed getting on this bandwagon? I was like, ha, ah, Royal Enfield can do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, I'll be well, in, like, just time out. Build Moto is a locally started, it hasn't STEM. gone more, it hasn't gone 
past Milwaukee. Yet, no, but, but if they let me be part of the board, it will. All right. Well, I sent an email yesterday. Check it. All right. Check it. <laughs> um, That's awesome. I, I got to be one of the first board members on that program, and you know it's close to the heart, and it's so fucking cool seeing where it started to. Warren, where you explain now. it to the audience who haven't heard of Build. I I do it basically is is high school students need something to belong to and what better way to get somebody interested in something than put a motorcycle in front of them so it you know it's a time management thing it's a confidence thing it's a it's a skills thing it's it a, is elective industrial arts elective course elective industrial it's after arts school. course yeah, yeah it's after school yeah it depends on what program you're running with there's all kinds it's a little bit of a a menage of, of people right so when i was doing it we were working with running rebels um their inner city youth group that helped inner city kids after school, give them a place to go and, and Keep them out of a trouble. safe space, a, a place for, you know, not getting in trouble. Correct. Learn some skills. Yeah. It was awesome. I, I really enjoyed my time doing that. I wish I could still do it and be a part of it. It's just, it's uh, we it a, lot a lot of, of time. Fun. Yeah. It's a lot of time. Now yeah. You have I a mean, family your now. son's been a part of that and yeah, yeah, you've yeah. been a part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. like, it's not just technical skills. It's business management. It's time management. It's social media, it's crowdfunding, it's fundraising, it's volunteer work. Like that's why I believe in yeah. it so much. It's not just one skill or one aspect that they're trying to like instill. It's it You have it, to get out and chat. It's social. It's, yeah, it's, it's you have to go you're going to, to new places and, and have to be confident enough to stand up in front of folks and, and you know, be inspiring and be It's also competitive with other schools yeah. and Well yeah, so that's yeah. the other thing, is right? Motorcycles. Competition is so you, well no, let's go let's go back to the fundamentals just for people who haven't know about it. You you give you get a bike mm-hmm. from Royal Enfield. Yep. And you put a team together and you customize that bike and you build a flat track race bike out of it. Yeah, so you have to submit a submit a design like you have to look at it and like see okay like this is what we can do and this is what we need to take off of it you know it's not just like hey we're going to build it like you have to go to your mentor and your board and say this is the design that i'm going to do this is why i'm going to do it these are the parts that i need and i'm going to utilize and this is how i'm going to get the parts no royal infield did provide like a parts allotment or whatever but they have to troubleshoot like they also have to figure out like what is not needed on a motorcycle it's not just saying I'm gonna change an upper and lower fairing. Like there is multiple things. Like you guys have all built like flat track bikes. And it's crazy to see like 14 to 18 year olds just trying to troubleshoot that process. But it also teaches them like when and how to ask for help, right? So you've got Chris Tribby, you've got people like Warren, you got like all these great people that are a great resource. Like teaching kids to suck it up and say like, I don't know, I need your guidance is a great thing. Like I do that, like Mm -hmm. I go to my CEO, I'm like, what was that acronym? There should like be it a, teaches you so much. There should right. be a, a class in every school from elementary up. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Right? Like a humble a humble class, a way to communicate with folks to figure out how to get through life, right? Like you can be a loner and some folks are good at that and successful, but you can learn shit unless you learn from your elders or folks that are peers that know more than you or you're open. And yeah. that that program is like when kids are come, come kids are coming to my shop. That's what I'm saying. You it's got pretty, space. like, a, it's a raw space, and, like, I don't have many rules except put your tools away and, and listen, and everybody was pretty rad. It was, I don't know, it was a humbling and, and great experience for me through my life, um, and it's just, it's just cool to see you keep rolling. One caveat that I think you you, were, you want to zoom in on a little more is that the kids did all of the work, right? You were yeah. not allowed to do the welding. No, you're or the, the kids. The kids have to do the work. Yeah. It's kid-led. I'm still working with with the kid that was in my first class he does cad work for me for my railing jobs or whatever motorcycle he stuff probably stayed in that because he had a good resource and someone to learn from like you can say like i helped pave the way for this kid in this career that he has now yeah. that's amazing yeah he's racing with us at flat out friday it's fucking cool that's yeah. awesome yeah. well because in when we were younger there were a lot more industrial arts classes available to people yeah. they're just not so much anymore well that's so. how it started yeah Dick, which is Dixon crazy was, yeah, which is more crazy. And more careers available in it and yeah. that the resources available for youth is not there yeah yeah, that yeah that's well that's how the, that was the premise of the of the program dixon with tim dixon from the iron horse saw that the schools were just cutting all of the electives when it comes to woodwork or metalwork or whatever and he just he was he saw an opening that that needed to be filled and that was a good idea. Yeah, it was great. Okay, yeah. so let's go back. Where where did we deviate from? Oh, that? so I so my first program that I wanted, like when they're like, Bree, like 
what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I want to support Build Moto um, from a Milwaukee perspective, but I also want to see it grow. I think this should be a national program. So OEMs, pay attention, <laughs> sign up for this. It keeps kids off the streets. It gets them on the bikes. It teaches them valuable resources for their future. Don't be assholes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with that, um, the pandemic happened. Um, but at the same time, um, I had a business associate associate in the UK that um, is an industrial designer, and he's like, "Yo, like, I know you want to do some stuff." And I'm like, "Yeah." And is he's that like, your best your best British accent? Rest. Yeah. Well, he's in, he's American, but he lives in the UK. Oh, okay. Right. So Go he's ahead. from Jersey too. I don't even know how Go to do that accent. Yeah, <laughs> He's like, so what do you want to do? I was like, oh, let me think about it. And then like overnight, I'm like, integrate my two loves. Like we're all infilled in racing. And I, I was like, let's do a like a program, but it's not about racing. It's about like mentoring women to like build motorcycles and to like race or race bikes, and then training them how to race instead of them going at it blind and looking like assholes like I did. Um, and then racing on a pro level or with the pro series. So. He's like, cool, what kind of support you need? You want to split budgets? You want to do this? You want to do that? And, uh, man, that became my life the last three and a half years. Like, I would say I was working BTR. 24 hours a day, you know, 12-hour day with my regular job, the rest of the time dedicated to BTR because I saw it. I saw the value in it. And, like, it was it was probably the coolest thing I've ever been able to do. And I was reminded – I'll probably get in trouble for saying this. Oops. Um, Royal Enfield isn't Brian. Brian isn't Royal Enfield. And I'm like, um, well, and I was going to say also BTR <laughs> is not Royal Enfield. Yeah. BTR is, is unfortunately, I think the brand. So I think that's because I become so passionate about something and I put everything I have into something. So when someone thinks of something, they associate with me good for me, bad for whatever. I want to see BTR succeed outside of me. Um, and I hope that it does. And I know that like Adrian um, over in the UK is like really vested in this. Uh, but it's gonna take people that are extremely dedicated and probably to the point of like absolute like they should be in an insane asylum <laughs> because it's not just one person. It is thirty women, fifteen in road racing, fifteen in um, flat track. But it's dealing with you guys. You guys know this. Like you have to deal with this. And if it's a single person, you have to have that. That has to be their like life. They have to live and breathe it in order to make it successful. And the women have to resonate with the person that they're bringing into this program. Every woman, whether they like me or not, knows how vested I was into BTR and seeing the success of it and seeing, like, making sure they had the resources and me, like, groveling to people that, like, to, to provide tires or whatever. Like, Dunlop was amazing, and I know they'll support it, but, like, there's so many things. Like, I ran the social media for it. I did the content for it. I did the web, like, everything. There has to be. But BTR is an amazing program. 44 women have gone through the program now. And I think they, except for, like, one chopper chick from California. But everyone else is, like, still just loving and living this life and, like, really appreciating the opportunity. I've, I've, I've had some of the ladies <clears throat> say they were riding their street bike on the road. They saw... A Harley broken down on the side of the road. She pulled over. Dude was having trouble. He, he didn't have tools. He didn't know how to fix it. She pulled out her toolkit from her Triumph. She wasn't riding a Royal Enfield, and she fixed his bike. She would have not had the resources or the know withal to like or the wherewithal to do that if she hadn't gone through the BTR program. For me, it's not just about the racing. It's about like giving confidence and inspiring and like educating and giving them tools if they're broken down or someone else is broken down on the side of the road. Um, this is my favorite story. Shout out to Alyssa Bridges. Um, All right. but yeah, that's great. That's yeah, a great story. I love BTR. I hope that it continues. I hope it so too. I think it's it really been uh, transformative for the scene, you know. And I did not realize that BTR wasn't just Royal Enfield. I knew it was Bree. Yeah. But I didn't know that it wasn't just purely Royal Enfield. So that's great. It's it is nice just job. Royal Enfield. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it wasn't. It's not. It was born of of your heart. Yeah. Not Royal Enfield's heart. Yeah. But. Th and again, this goes back to like tying the bow on like my thing is it took a while, but Royal Enfield was so supportive of every crazy idea I threw out there. That's them. great. They're like, uh, you want to ride motorcycles in Alaska with a 55 year old software engineer, a 30 year old punk rock chick, a goth skateboarder? Sure. 
Yeah. Like, they don't ask me why. They yeah. just know. And it, and, it, and everything has come out very well. So I think that, like, every brand should be like that, is be open to, like, if yeah. you hire a team, like, trust in, like, the crazy shit that they put in their head and know that there's something good that will come out of it. Mad respect. I mean, I really think that that would be enough for, like, some kind of a documentary about just the last bunch of years of, of Royal Enfield and all the different things that they've kind of ushered through media and events and promotion and riding and inclusivity because it really has brought all that stuff. And I remember when you did that that trip because you you did that trip, but you you were like – you came. You were like you came back from South America, and then you were going to Alaska, yeah. and then as soon as you got home, you were leaving to go to somewhere else India, too, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So, geez. Like for me, like it's That's again lot. community, and it's about like thinking outside the box. Like, yeah, we could do demo tours all the time, which is great. Like it, it puts butts on seats, but it's like providing the experience and like, like saturating people's hearts and like minds with that whatever was done and like making sure they don't forget about it and keeping them as lifelong motorcyclists. It's not for, like, selling the roll in fields. A lot of them were already, like, motorcycle owners. It's about, like, making them, like, believe in two wheels and, like, keeping them in that community. And, uh, I mean, selfishly, it was always on Royal Enfields for me, but, I mean, I think every woman that I've crossed paths with or people I've taken on epic rides or all the other crazy shit that I've done, I think everyone's going to continue riding two wheels because they had a positive experience that right. they can hold on to. Yeah, when you just like anything but motorcycle is for the motorcycle community once you get into it there's no getting out of it and it's not when i say getting out of it, it's not by choice it's like you you yeah, actually it is by choice you want to well stay. you have to yeah and you, you you almost have to like physically extricate yourself yeah, from and, the the stream that you're in because once you get your into that sort of like that river rapids of like the motorcycle world it's like you're just in it and it, it can take you which it did and that's why I left. So, mm-hmm. like, for me, Royal Enfield was my life. And it's a, been a great life. But, like, I need to, like, fall in love with motorcycling for me mm-hmm. and not for the brand. And I will always ride my Royal Enfields, but I will ride my Air Machis. I'll ride my Cowies, my Ducatis, my Hondas, my KT, everything. Yeah. But, like, for me, like, I need to put myself back into the motorcycling mindset that uh, – like for me personally, and I that's taking a step away. Like I am not gonna lie, like I cry like a bitch every single night. I love Royal Enfield. I miss it so much, but I know that I needed to like have a personal life and love for motorcycles again. Well, when did you reach that crux? Was it that was it that trip? Like those series of trips? Like was that because that was kind of near the end, right? When you were did the Alaska trip? That was like and... in twenty twenty, I think. Um, it was having meetings at like 2.30 a.m. and then people not even noticing that you were in that meeting. That really f- freaking got to me. Like, oh, were you there? I'm like, yeah, you invited me and you know that like I will never be late for anything and I will always attend every meeting. Um, it's also, I don't know, like there's always people that like don't appreciate you and you feel it. Right. And I, the people that you want to appreciate you, I don't know, like Sid Lull, fucking amazing human being. Um, he'll probably never talk to me again. Um, but he was so instrumental in every like thing in my life. But uh, I don't know, just like I couldn't wake up at two thirty in the morning anymore. But I didn't know how to say no, and it's my fault, right? Like I could say no, but then I feel like I was missing out on an integral part of like making this business successful. And I'm all about like making things successful and like being like a team player. Um, so I think the last year or two were just like, girl, stop. And when was the last time you rode a motorcycle because you wanted to? Right. Couldn't remember. And I was like, time to go. Um, also, can't talk much about the new company, um, but I work for four wheels, not two wheels anymore. And uh, the ex-president of Royal Enfield Americas, Rod Copes, who is the, probably the most amazing human being I've ever met, switched to Rivian, um, reached out to me and said, I have this great opportunity. I want you to be a part of like uh, helping this startup. And do you want to be in? And, like, I heard his name, I heard his voice, and I was like, deal. So, and now I can ride motorcycles because I love them, not yes. because I have to. Yeah, so. that's important. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I, 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 you know that we all applaud uh, any human's change for the better, right? There's no, <laughs> and if anybody ever forgets that, 
Uh, I want I want to address that you said you know about organizing and, and you make it look easy and, and I think that's a curse that a good org organizer has. So when you make it look easy, people assume it's easy, mm -hmm. and so then you don't get appreciated. Yep. Yeah. How hard can this be running this you know this this TRB program? You know, <laughs> how, can, how hard can it be? Look at look at it. Look at how easy it is, and they don't know how hard you yeah. you did it. So when things look easy, that's a compliment to the organizer. And I also want to mention that early on you said something that. We often say around my household, um, you were describing a Royal Enfield, and you said it doesn't have to be large to be fun. High five on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for someone to chime in with the porno. Really. Yeah, I didn't forget. Yeah, yeah. 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 I didn't forget. All right. Well, well uh, uh, Bree, so you mentioned a little bit about your job, um, but ultimately, you know, what's what's next? You, you're... Uh, you want to go to school more. You, you know, you have an excitement. You have a, a, an excitement that's contagious. Yeah. Uh, well, what else? You're only like gonorrhea. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, awesome. gonorrhea it is exciting and contagious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you're only forty. Yeah, forty-one. You talk, but yeah. You talk about forty like it's your life's not even half done, right? So what's what's next for you, Bree? So when I was 20, I told myself at 40 I'd be the CEO of a company. I'm not. So uh, I have a lot uh, ahead of me. I, I told myself a lot of shit at 20, but I was full <laughs> of shit. Okay? Yeah. We grow and we change. Yeah. We do, but I, I, I think I've always... I'm the same person I was before I had my son. Uh, I've just shifted things a little bit differently, but like I still want to be a CEO. I feel like... or the head of a company, um, and to be able to like influence so many lives for the people that work for me. It's not necessarily about the sales and the revenue. It's about like having an amazing group of people that want to work for you and create something fantastic together. That's why I shifted to, one of the reasons why I shifted to this company is I'm the head of brand. Like I officially have a title that I think is fitting for the work that I do. Getting a title that you feel you rightfully deserve and getting that, I think, is a morale booster. And I needed it. Mm -hmm. I fought so long to be like, hey, can I be lead? And it was just like such a hard internal conversation. I'm like, why? I, I, I'm doing all those things that it takes. So having the ability to like bring a new company to the market and something in a, like a really cool space um, is great. Um, for me, it's about like, I'm 40, so I can have a little bit of fun in my life now, too. My son is uh, graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. I tell him to depend on me financially, and he refuses. I, like, try to give him cars and motorcycles. He's like, I don't need anything, Mom. So I'm just going to blow up money I have buying sneakers and motorcycles <laughs> and <laughs> traveling the world. Um, but also, like, giving myself a really good work-life balance. But now I can, like, be in the motorcycle community the way that I want to be in it, and that's, like telling the board of build moto to like bring me on or convincing warren and scott to let me be a volunteer and helping <laughs> i want to be involved like um the women in motorcycling community wants me to still speak with them mm -hmm. um olin's had me speak at a conference last week for like four thousand people because they think i'm rad which is stupid but um, owens uh, olin's uh, uh suspension. suspension um they are owned by a bigger company yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um a, huge brand uh but like i need to stay involved somehow i'm mm -hmm, just glad mm -hmm. it's not going to be like 24 hours of my life but i look forward yeah. to also spending a lot of uh my free time in winter in florida i, I got two two things i want to i want to i'm going to challenge you out you uh -oh. you mentioned p part of your philosophy or your overriding theme today is that i am not my job mm -hmm. but yet you're defining yourself by being a ceo as if you're disappointed because I does, think as CEO, I can give myself time off. <laughs> <laughs> but you're still, but you're, but you're, but you're still identifying yourself with True. your job. I know. I don't know how to shut it off, and that's what I need to learn, right? Like, I need to learn that like being a CEO is not who I am. It's just part of like, I don't know, my nine to five or something. But like for me, my goal is to be successful. So my son, I knew I was gonna get emotional. I want him to see that his mom is a single mom at 21, kicked ass, and gives him power. Yeah, yeah that's you're you kicking know. ass. So I know it's like, I'm saying a CEO, being a CEO defines me, but it's also personally like my son seeing a powerful woman, being able to like come out of like weird situations and like a motorcycle industry and racing and like 
become a powerhouse. Like I'm sure. not gonna let myself down. Like I, I need it. Well, he sees it, and thousands of other sons and daughters see it. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, mission accomplished. Bold statement. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, keep on kicking ass. God, yeah, why you fight me such a pussy? Oh, right? oh man, come on. That's what we I'm do. with three dudes uh, and I cry. Let's, 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 let's get one more question. Here's a new theory that I have in my life, and I just want to bounce it off you. I, I heard a theory that you can only be liked or respected, not both. Right? Yeah. What do you want to do? Respected. Okay. Because a lot of people don't like me, but they respect what I've done, and I'm perfectly fine with that. <laughs> there's a Yeah, there's a, there's a hump that you get over in your life. And you're that, just over it. Yeah, it's yeah. liberating, mm-hmm. you know. It's still, can, you're, but it, it sucks because you're, like, you're almost taught that you have to be liked. Yeah. You know, it's not like when that. I don't get that Instagram like from like that person that's following me, I'm like, why do you care, right? Yeah. Yeah, like being liked, it consumes us. Like, but mm-hmm. if yeah. someone respects me, that means they've taken the time to like consider what I've done or the contributions I've made and that's more important than that stupid Instagram like or that in person like someone might not like me a lot of people don't and I'm perfectly okay with that but they respect like the work that I've done mm-hmm. and that's fine yeah. a lot of those just, a lot of those yeah. no like folks are it's it's not it's just that they're not comfortable with with themselves enough to admit the fact that you might be a little bit more successful or if you've done a little bit more you know, you've you've made larger strides than they have. It's it's just a, you know, it's just a sad sad yep. fact about a, a majority of the folks in the world that just can't accept the fact that they're fuck ups or. <laughs> Everyone has or, like I hate to say this, but like, there's people that have worked for me or I work next to that had the same opportunities. They just didn't have the drive or like whatever or the voice. It's not even about working the twenty four hours a day, but like speak up for yourself. If you have a great idea, bring it to the table. If you want to help with something bring it to that person and say you want to help them don't expect opportunities just be given to you you have to make those right. opportunities for yourself and you also have to like bring something to the table you can't just be like oh well you have a degree in this so you just naturally get this no like you have to like show there's a million people with a marketing degree degree why do you, are you different or why can't you be different than that person and it's just like people just want things given to them all the time instead of just like working for it or just coming up with a crazy idea that your company supports like yeah. put it out there if you don't put it out there you never know i think that there's also another topic in there that it's like there's a lot of people that are aspirational that can't figure out how to make their way to where their goals and where they want to be in life but there's a lot of other people who don't that they're they're they don't need to advance right like that and they're fine with where they are in life and what they're doing and where and that and that's fine too and, and like, i gotta we never remind talk about myself that. of that yeah yeah because i get on a lot of people in this community you know people that i'm around i'm like dude you've been working the same job for like 10 years like are you cool with that and they're like yeah and i'm like i have to tell myself it's okay it's okay to be like that mm-hmm. it yeah. is 100 percent and Thank yeah. you for that. But there's, but there's, a, but I think that that's the thing. It's like we lump in the people that get salty about other people, like you know, advancing, like getting where they want to go, with uh, with everybody else who's just like kind of like I'm, I'm good, like I'm good right here, like I like my house, I like my where yeah. I live, I like my job, and and so there's a difference, right? The people who get like whatever you got, what you because somebody gave it to you or whatever, whatever mm-hmm. their bullshit. Yeah. Comments are. Oh, it's. But they're the minority, right? They're this small little bit of people. They, they that... just sting. They just sting. A lot right? harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it they does. Yeah, they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, hey, how are we doing on time? Way over. Okay. <laughs> All <right. laughs> Always. <laughs> That's super a sign of a good show, yeah, guys. Yeah, super good hang show. On, hang on, hang on. I thought you were going to say, like, we got 20 more minutes left. No. T- t- tell us, t- <laughs> tell us here, uh, uh, young man, sure. everything we've asked you since you came here, you didn't know. I'm, I'm drawing a line in the sand right now with a question here, okay? <laughs> okay. Right. Tell us about your mother. That's a really loaded question. Come on, give me, give me, give me 30 seconds. 30 seconds, all right. So I remember a lot from when I lived with my mother in Virginia. She's done quite a bit. I remember at one time she worked at a saloon. She worked at Tyson's Mall. I just remember specifically eating chicken pot pie at Tyson's Mall, and then there's a sushi conveyor belt, and she would take me there. 
you know, I was a pretty weird kid. I didn't really do a lot. I am not as interested or not really in motorcycles as she is, but it's pretty damn cool to see where she got, you know. Sure. Just from, you know, being a teenager in Virginia, having a kid at 21 to doing what she's doing now. Mm -hmm. That's a lot more than I think a lot of people have done. Mm -hmm. and, and I think your power transcends, transcends sex. That's what I want to hi uh, highlight. Um, that your power is more than just your, the women you inspire, it's the men you inspire. Yeah, Bold well, statement. Yeah. That kid that you just talked to is the reason I do everything. All right. Uh, you you wrapped it up well there, young man. Yeah. Is that the bow? <laughs> All right. That's the bow. Okay. Well, let, let's... Uh, Can we let's... do Salt Bay? Isn't that a thing now? Like that guy? Well, we traditionally end it like this. Thanks for coming, Bree. All Thank right. you. Thanks, Bree. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. really, really great to talk. Do you have so. anything you want to plug? Uh, apparently, Hayes Ranch. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. They're selling ranch water in big glass bottles now. I like it. Hit me up on the gram. <laughs> Shoot me a like. <laughs>